Well, hello, everyone. Thanks to the organizers for the chance to come and speak to this group. Um, my lab is generally interested in developing and applying mammalian synthetic biology technologies to a bunch of problems. I picked a story today that I hope to dovetail with some of the discussion we've been having today. So uh, engineered cell-based therapies have been mentioned uh, by a few previous speakers here. So just to point out a few of the key observa or key advantages that these products have compared to, say, traditional drugs, on-demand synthesis, sustained production, and importantly for this talk, localized production in a way that's conditioned upon the environment or the physiological state around the cell makes these therapies able to do things we can't do with drugs uh, currently. And so in particular, conduct of sophisticated functions like cell killing is something we can do uniquely with engineered cell therapies. So many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the use of engineered immune cells in order to treat cancer, and we got excited about that a number of years back as well. The story I'll be talking to you today about addresses one of the gaps currently in the use of engineered immune cells to treat cancer. So for our purposes, we know from preclinical work that one of the barriers to cancer immunotherapy is local immune suppression at the tumor site. And we also know that if you could cause there to be local continuous production of immune stimulants at the tumor site, this could overcome that barrier. So we decided a couple of years back to try to develop engineered cell therapies that specifically carry out that function. And so for our purposes, we've been trying to figure out a way to engineer a cell so that maybe it goes every place in the body, but only when it's sitting next to a tumor does it produce an immune stimulant that's powerful enough to do the job such that it would be toxic if it happened everywhere in your body, and we really need it to happen just in one location. When you look at what sort of information the engineered cell would need to consider when deciding whether it's next to a tumor or not, most of the key environmental factors are extracellular. So cytokines, chemokines, growth factors, these are things you find enriched at the tumor site compared to elsewhere. So that's the kind of information that our engineered cell would need to take in to process whether or not it's in the right place to carry out its function. And when we took on this project in about 2012 or so, there really weren't good tools for doing this absent native receptors, which just really aren't facile for pro programming into customized functions. So about, uh, about that time, we developed a novel technology platform, which we call the Modular Extracellular Sensor Architecture. Uh, the plot at the left here shows you the cartoon, which took me about five minutes to draw and these graduate students about three years to figure out. And they're really good. Don't get that message wrong. But the idea here is that in order for this to work, there are two receptor chains. One chain has a protease on the inside. The other chain has a sequestered transcription factor. And this whole thing only works if the protease cuts the transcription factor free of the membrane only when the ligand is present and not when the ligand is absent. So we had to figure out through a lot of protein engineering tricks and kinetic tuning how to get that to happen in a way that was dimerization dependent. And I'm really just showing you the last data slide from that study where we showed that for a model ligand, rapamycin, this works and that we can get a nice tenfold induction of an output gene uh, when using this platform. So this kind of showed that it was possible to do such a thing. It was the first really ground up kind of receptor like this. So it was important to understand whether that biophysical space uh, is feasible in reality. But of course, we want to do more interesting things with it. So in a more recent study, we took the same more or less architecture and tried to see if we could sense something interesting and then do something interesting. And so the thing we tried to sense was in this case VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. Uh, this is present in basically every solid tumor. And that's good because it's not an antigen that's specific to any one type of cancer. It's also enriched at the tumor site compared to the blood of those very same patients, maybe 10 to 100 fold. It might be even higher if you consider the fact that it's deposited locally on the, the surface of endothelia, for example. So VEGF is a good candidate for marking the tumor microenvironment for a lot of types of cancers. And then as far as an output gene, we just selected for this study to use IL-2, or to try to make our cells produce IL-2 in response to VEGF. A uh, few reasons why. IL-2 is one of those immune stimulants that's been proposed. If you inject it systemically, it doesn't work. You get toxicity before you get benefit. And if you could indu it lo induce it locally, it might have a chance of actually overcoming this barrier I told you about. And for the sake of uh, making this a little more general, we also didn't use a transgene like the GFP in the last study. We instead tried to regulate the endogenous IL-2 locus for some cells. So we're trying to rewire a cell's functionality. Also, there's no cell that senses VEGF and makes IL-2 in response. So this would be a totally novel immune function if we're able to pull that off. So again, skipping over all the work to the last slide, it worked. And the nice thing about this is we did not have to redo the architecture. We had to solve some problems related to maybe the expression levels, and that has to do to some extent that we're using antibodies as binding domains. 
But once those are solved, they seem to be general solutions. And we showed that when we implement this uh, technology in either workhorse HEK cells or in human GERCAT T cells, they are sensing VEGF and secreting IL-2 protein in response. Uh, the other thing I'm not, I didn't mention just before is that we swapped out the generic TTA uh, transcription factor for one based upon Cas9. Conceivably, this could be directed to any endogenous locus. So this shows that it works, but of course, we want to also see whether we can do some more sophisticated cellular programming. And so the last story I'll show you is trying to implement this kind of logic using engineered cells. This gets at the topic of this meeting. So recently we showed that uh, we recently attempted to implement what we would call a single transcriptional, single layer transcriptional AND gate by essentially playing around with engineered promoters responsive to two different transcription factors and hooking them onto those two receptors I just told you about. The question is, can we multiplex it? And if so, how do we do that? So we, we went about this process in the way you might expect. We sort of played around with promoter designs. We dialed up the expression levels to try to make it so that those promoters would turn on when you have differences in transcription factors uh, corresponding to the ligand-free and ligand-present conditions. And we were able to get this to work, sort of. I would say that graph shows that we are getting a different response, a bigger response, when both ligands are present. But a key question we had was really how far can you push this? What are the opportunities for making it better? And this also, I, I didn't show, is, is the first study we had a big data set to actually train a computational model to ask us how good can you make this without simply trying to make it better. And this also gets at a question we've been interested in a while here, which is how does heterogeneity play a role in the performance of engineered cell functions in general? This is kind of a general question that folks in this field are interested in, and we were interested in this as well from both the practical, this is kind of a translationally motivated slide, but also in this kind of performance optimization way. So what we did is take that big pile of data we had now, train, oops, that's the end of my time, or I'm stealing it back, okay, no. It, it says something happened here. Well, right there, we, we applied it in humans and cured like 95 people. It's too bad you... <laughs> okay, hold on one sec. Is someone in the back manipulating this? Because it seems haunted. Okay. I'm going to do this one more time. Okay, and hop to that slide. Great. Okay, so last two slides. Now... Do you know what's going on? PowerPoint's crashing. So. PowerPoint's crashing. Don't, Don't go into presenter mode. OK, everyone loves that. So my, <laughs> my uh, comments here. I'll make it real quick. The basic premise, I'll tell you as it's loading up here, we came up with a mathematical model to figure out how our stuff works. And one of the lessons we found with that model is that it turns out that heterogeneity plays an unsuspected, unsuspectedly important role in how well these things work. And so I'm going to take Jeff's suggestion here and just go through this. Uh, like, boy, is that really good? David. So if you guys can hear me, I can tell you the main parts. So the premise here is that we use this mathematical model to figure out what role heterogeneity plays in our system. And one of the take-homes is that most of the cells in any one experiment are doing nothing. And in fact, when you try to optimize your system performance by looking at only mean behaviors, you're really optimizing performance with respect to a very small subset of the overall system. So we figured that out kind of with this mathematical model, validated what we had uh, predicted with this. OK. You want me to just stay in this mode? Yeah. OK. And then I'll just show you the, the key bit here at the end. So the model more or less showed, suggested that there was this kind of difference between the mean cell behavior and the behavior of the mean. And the really cool thing for me is that the model actually predicted something useful. So if we took our same cells, if we took our same uh, experiment and post hoc identified that subset predicted to have the really optimal expression window, we got a huge boost in the way that the system performed. We went from a five-fold or two to five-fold um, fold increase to something maybe around like 10 to 20 fold increase in the plus and minus ligand signal. That's the biggest change we've ever seen before. And so we're really spending a lot of time now taking these model guided approaches to figure out two things. How does expression impact performance? And more importantly, how can you design your systems to function within this range of expression levels that we see? And this is really what got us interested in looking at technologies like artificial genomes and artificial chromosomes in particular, because we feel, and this is really a comment that applies to a lot of folks in this space, we have few 
few under, we have little understanding at the moment about how these sources of variation can be reduced, controlled, or designed around in order to make systems that function well. And I think that engineered genomes and engineered chromosomes offer a lot of opportunities to both test out designs and also better learn the rules as to how we could implement eventually increasingly sophisticated cell functions. So I'm way over my time now. Thanks for your patience with the tech issues, and I'll take a question if we have time for it. Thanks. I have a question. <laughs> so the 20% you're talking about, which are better or like the optimal ones, so mm. what do you do with them? You select them out and then you see the difference? Is it like one heterogeneity like on a phenotypic level? Or do they, do, like if you take them and like flow, like do a flow cytometry in them again, do you see the same heterogeneity? That's the exact idea we had. So, so the idea at first was that that's a post hoc analysis. We can go back and look at the data and just reanalyze it. That's what that data was showing right there. You could, of course, do flow cytometry initially there. And as far as being optimal, the idea was, and this gets a little more into the weeds, we predicted that there was a dosage effect that had to do with the ratio between the transcription factors and the plasmid, the reporter, that would give you this kind of synergistic activation. So any way you could achieve that would presumably have the same sort of benefit. We, we did it in this case by using that dose based post hoc analysis. But yes, if you wanted to, you could conceivably, if you couldn't fix it, you could just select those cells out that had the highest dose and only use them, for example, in the therapeutic. Okay, thanks.